So, um, my name is Carl Levarez-Firta. I'm the Technology Director at EXO. I'm going to talk about, talk about uh, serving the Internet of Things with Drupal. Um, Um, I'm going to, in this session, I'm going to go through briefly on what's the Internet of, of Things in this uh, aspect of this session, because uh, it's a buzzword and everybody has their own idea of it. <clears throat> I'm also going to try and open up horizons on <clears throat> what we can actually do with Drupal and, and you know, how far the limitations actually are on what you can do with Drupal. Um, the session won't be technical, but I'm going to let you feast your eyes on some architectural drawings along the session. But um, so let's go to business. What's the Internet of Things? So <clears throat> it's a buzzword with a lot of meanings. Everybody has, a, has their own idea of what it means. I've heard definitions ranging from you know anything other than computers to specific uh, physical things doing something physical in in the in the physical world um, to get things aligned I'm gonna define for this session it I'm not saying that this is the only true meaning of it I'm, so, I'm just saying that I'm gonna use this as the definition in this session so Usually, we refer to all things gaining internet ac access from uh, smartwatches to toasters. I have never heard of a toaster that actually has an internet access, but there might be one. Probably really useful. <clears throat> In this presentation, um, the definition is going to be everyday things connecting to the internet, things that didn't, didn't previously connect, but these days do. Um, so things like home automation, energy equipment, wearables, but also consumer electronics that are increasingly gaining internet connections. Let's take a look at a couple of examples to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. You all know Nest. Nest is a home thermostat, a really famous one, controls your home and learns how you live. So it Adjust it just right, adjusts it just right. There's a plethora of um, integrations available for it, so it can control a lot of other things as well. Or, or a um, um, sensor for your waste container. It's going to call the people to empty it when it's full. That's pretty straightforward, simple. There's a web service where you can check your expected. Uh, fill updates for your waste containers and stuff. That's the Internet of Things. That's not a toaster. It's a fridge. I, I find this really awesome, by the way. I still don't find any purpose for it, but awesome. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a Samsung fridge that has an uh, Internet connection. It has a, some kind of a proprietary software that you can, you know, do apps and stuff like like Samsung smart TVs. It also got hacked a couple of weeks ago <laughs> because they don't check the SSL certificates authentic authenticity, which is kind of bad. But yeah, here's another one. That's a rifle that you can aim with uh, with a computer or an iPad. It also got hacked, which sounds a bit scary, I mean, <laughs> genuinely scary. Um, you can re-aim it with, with, via the hack, which sounds even scarier. But yeah, I hope, I hope um, well, yeah, it's mind-blowing. I hope not literally. So let's go to the business. Why? What, what does my fridge need Drupal for? Um, let's go through what, what Drupal offers. I'll try to tell it from the perspective of a fridge. Um, Drupal offers a platform for content. Say um, your fridge wants to list you product information 
from a grocery store that delivers. That would be kind of convenient, I guess. Let your fridge show you um, what's available from your local grocery store. Um, it offers you a platform for easily <laughs> controllable data structures and data in it. Um, that would be like maybe recipes that the fridge could maybe offer based on what's in your fridge right now. The Samsung fridge, by the way, doesn't know what's in your fridge as far as I know. I hope it doesn't, but it, it just shows you other stuff, I guess. Um, Drupal offers fine-grained user control and access control, so you can control the access to, to a uh, shop for grocery store. Uh, grocery items. Uh, it offers a platform for online stores, commerce, and then it offers, you know, user-generated content and stuff like that. So you can even have your grocery store shop on your fridge show user reviews, so that you can select the best yogurt by your peers. So what you need is a is a is a Drupal that works as a backend. Um, until Drupal 8, all Drupals were really kind of web content management systems, so they were returning HTML when you requested um, something with HTTP, like get or post. Um, Drupal 8 changes this, although all earlier Drupals can be made to do the same, basically at least seven. Um, but uh, Drupal 8 is the first that, that's not directly aimed at coupling uh, HTML uh, with, with your data that's stored inside it. So if you remove your front end from your Drupal, it, it becomes a content and a serv service platform, and it's pretty powerful in that. Um, it can do a lot more than just web pages. Um, the decoupling um, the HTML layer that we call headless Drupal, um, that's something that was aimed for the flexibility of the front end. So we wanted to build like really app-like front ends or have full control over your, over your front end or develop it faster or, you know, I don't know, all these things. Um, and it's, you know, still used for that, obviously. Um, uh, we're, we're currently building one site that has a headless Drupal and then it has like a Node.js layer and React and isomorphic rendering and you know all the hype words in the same project. Um, but uh, it also makes Drupal <coughs> fully capable of connecting to any system that can read its data. So when Dries said that like full decoupling works in only very narrow cases. <laughs> this would be those cases. But let's look at some examples. These are just to give you an idea of why and what you might you know, consider to use Drupal um, for in, in a system where there's different connected devices. And this is, these are imaginary examples. I'm not saying we wouldn't be building something like this, but I can't also say that we would be building. Anyway, the real world is not as clean as these examples. Let's let's put it that way. Um, here's an example: uh, health monitoring service. So you have a, you have your smart tracking device on your wrist. Then you you <coughs> you, you store that data somehow outside. Uh, there's a web application where you can check your activity and stuff, and then there might be a health app in your phone that also delivers that information. Um, you can store all the textual content into, into Drupal, but what Drupal offers for this kind of service, this kind of service would be sto data storage services, generating reports for the data, user profiles, social connections between your friends, so you can share data between my friends as well, automatic emails, reminders, push notifications. Just think about the options that you can get pretty much 
you know, done free from Drupal for this. You can't ignore that. Let's take another example. Um, uh, this would be a self-service gym. So there's a mobile site. There's a smart lock in the door of the gym. So you can get in uh, via the mobile site so that uh, either you have a passcode for the lock or it's actually you know connected to the site so you can go and click it to open. There are locks like that on, on the market, plenty of them, different locks that you can use. You can use an app for opening doors, and if you lose your phone, then your sheet out of lock. But that happens also if you lose your keys. So um, in, in this situation, Drupal would offer a, a shop with connections to, to payment, payment gateways, different roles for different users. Say, uh, if you get a gym membership that you can only use during work days, during the daytime of work days. Reminder emails, statistics, workout reminders for users. Again, you know, there's a lot of possibilities here. And this is what we briefly touched here as an example for the beloved fridge. Um, an app in a connected fridge that can, you know, let you order groceries while staying on the door. But it's actually the Samsung fridge, you can open the door and it's still, the app is right there, so you can see to the fridge and still, you know, click away. That's how it works. The, the, the freezer is, I, I guess, behind the app, the thing that you need to refill separately, I don't know. But this is, again, a full-blown online store, and there's no reason, really, if you would have an app on a fridge that allows you to buy groceries, why wouldn't you have the same um, shop also as a web service online? And then you could also serve the people who have their you know, iPad connect just attached to their fridge door. I've seen those. But in the real world, as I said, it's not that clean and simple to explain, but the, th the things we've done with um, different IoT implementations. Um, we've done smart TVs, for instance, uh, an API feeding Drupal information uh, with, um, with like Drupal content out to uh, smart TVs. Also, that needed some special arrangements for the smart TVs, so it Usually the, the we'll get to that later, but usually the things aren't you know that straightforward as you would think. Again, that's the real wide world here. Um, we've done medical wrist alarm devices. Again, that those things don't speak rest. We'll get to that later <laughs> as well. And then we've done handheld golf gaming devices, um, which had. Part of the stuff was working to Drupal, so. And we're currently building another Drupal-enabled feed that, that also is directed at feeding, feeding machines. We don't know what machines yet, but I hope we'll get to that part later. So, how do we do this? Uh, I can let you in in a, uh, a bit of a secret. It's not that hard, really. You just have to have the courage to do it with Drupal. You feel like Drupal is for the web, it's not for the web, it can do a lot of other things as well. You just need to have the balls to sell it for this purpose. But yeah, serving machines. Easiest approach, a REST API. This is hugely popular these days, talking about REST APIs and stuff, but um, that's what it is. Um, Drupal 7 has modules for serving um, data out with REST, like services, REST, WES, REST full, JS module, endpoint, if you want something more exotic. They also partially bootstrap Drupal, so you can get performance gains with them. Drupal 8 ships with a, with a REST module in core. Um, if you want to find good comparison, or well, yeah, a good comparison of REST modules, there was a, a session by Konstantin Komelin and Kate Marsalkina in Drupal Camp Baltics a couple of weeks ago. So you can find it online. <clears throat> you can check that out. Um, 
any service um, what does that sentence even mean? Let's go to the next line. For example, Drupal 8, <laughs> well, yeah, so Drupal 8 REST APIs are really, you know, Drupal specific. If you, if you look at the output coming from a Drupal 8 REST API, it has a lot of things. That's, you know, if you don't, if you're not a Drupal developer, you'd be like, you know, really pondering on what, what, is, what is this all about? What, what, what kind of feels? There's a lot of feels that, that have something to do with Drupal and not that much with the actual data. So, Dries even mentioned that in the Dries note today. He, he, he said that, that there's either too much stuff or too little stuff or you need to do multiple calls to get, get the information. So, you should separate your Drupal's internal data structures from the actual API you're ser serving out so that your API is good. And also that's, that's you know, kind of what it's all about. So, the API should just be for the API and not for any any of the systems. And uh, I'm not saying that you should separate them for security purposes because that's just stupid. I hate when someone tells me, tells me that, well, you can see the internal data structure from there. Yeah, you can see the internal data structure. That's security to obscurity and that's nonsense. Doesn't really secure anything from anyone. Um, okay, so a proper REST API follows the REST API rules. They're stateless, cacheable, layered, uniform. Um, it also needs to be well documented. If you're serving out stuff from an API, it's paramount, I'd say, to have a good up-to-date documentation. You can use a web page. You can use uh, some services online for it, like Apiary, Swagger. You can use Markdown to do your documentation, convert, convert it to everything. It needs to be secure. So you can do, if, if you have a real Drupal API that offers access to, let's say, internal systems behind it, it can, you can do very dangerous things with, with it. So you need to take, con consider that really thoroughly. And then you, you should take into account that when you have an API, you should always have either versioning or it should be backwards compatible. I can tell you from you know, experience that I, would, I always prefer versioning even though it's a hassle because backwards compatibility just you know, has you carrying out that legacy stuff for ages and years and, and it's, but I understand people who have to do that as well. It's okay. Um, an open API with a proper documentation is a good way to open up your resources for all the network things out there, but that's not nearly enough usually. Many times there's something totally different you'll have to integrate to, so there's no device that can, you know, you can just tell that developer that, well, I have a REST API, just read my API, get the content from there. No, actually there's, you know, something really odd happening in the other end and you'll have to do the architecture all the way around. Um, in my experience, the, the difference between different clients comes from the computing power available or the, or the kind of maturity of the, of the com, com, computing platform. If it's, a, if it's a, like a handheld device built by your customer themselves and they write some really low level stuff on this, they might be really reluctant to follow like the good principles of REST API, they just offer you some, you know, binary proprietary format that you'd have to read and maybe <coughs> decipher and, and, and decipher again. Um, if you have a, like a smart TV on the other end, that's a programming platform that can do a lot of things. So there's like system level services for accessing REST APIs, shouldn't be a problem. If you have a, a, a really small, Wrist, wristwatch size thing, but not an Apple watch. I'm saying like a really more like a stupid watch. Then it's, it, it, it becomes that you'll be in a, in a mess of deciphering and ciphering binary things back and forth.
And if you're connecting the other way around, so you'll have to connect to all the services, all the all the systems around there. It's like push information from Drupal to the other way. It's totally different than connecting to servers running in server halls because it's it's a uh, appalling performance available on the other end, like almost useless network uh, reliability. And you might be connecting to a lot of them, but it's like out of your perfect API blueprints and, and you know, then you just go and do a really, well, specific implementation of a, of a format connecting there. <clears throat> but when, whenever you're connecting to machines, um, there's, there's, there's an architecture that you need to consider, performance, persistence, and security. The, the connection architecture is important. You have to at least have some kind of queuing process to prevent losing, the connections losing data because the connections are unreliable always. More elegant approach would be to use some kind of a queuing message queue system that might work be a bit better. You can still integrate Drupal into them. It's not a problem if the other end can use something like that. And then the, then the messaging system takes care of your messages going through. I personally use a considerable time of, time of architecture design. Every time we have a situation where there's uh, questions about performance, reliability, that kind of stuff. And then um, you just have to adjust it along the way a, a lot of times and you have to make compromises and stuff. Okay, let's talk a bit about content as a service because that's what we're doing here. We're serving content, but we do it as a service. So we're just serving content, not uh, HTML pages. Take a short plunge with Drupal architectures. Um, it's an evolution of sorts, but it's not something that you would always end up at the bottom of it. But, you know, there was a time when just the Drupal website was enough. There are still many times like that. But then you needed a couple of integrations. You just put varnish up front and it's your really typical Drupal implementation. You integrate to some uh, standard CRM and a non-standard ERP, in my experience. And then there's a mobile app which you need to serve either, you know, HTML or, or a JSON view or something from Drupal. You can always have a REST API at this phase as well. But when you do a REST API, you might go you know, all the way headless. And why, if you're going headless anyway, you can you know, serve other things as well. Don't, don't limit yourself. So this is, this is where we at in, in a, in a, where we are at in a, in a good situation where we, you know, we have systems that can read a proper, good, well-documented API, and there's no problems serving all your Drupal content out there. And if Drupal can't, can't perform, then there's the option of moving it behind as part of the enterprise system level, you know, background services, and then use something else to aggregate the API. And that's something I'm gonna talk about briefly here. So <clears throat> sometimes you have the need to build an external API. You can't use Drupal for it because there's like too much stuff that you'd have to build on Drupal or there's too specific proprietary connection architecture that you have to follow that might need, for instance, callbacks uh, or, or, you know, event-based handling of, of stuff going through in and out. Uh, I've had this um, talk 
about accelerating headless Drupal with Node.js. And at, in, the, in this talk, I did mention this or explain this a bit further, um, how you build an external API. So <clears throat> building an external API, in this approach, you index all your content outside of Drupal every time it's edited. Mm, to a MongoDB or you know Solar, Elasticsearch, Redis. To index your stuff to MongoDB, there's a there's a module for it. Uh, we did one module for uh, we'd be using it from for multiple production environments now called MongoDB Indexer. It's just storing all your all your content outside of Drupal, or you can configure what content it stores outside of Drupal. Mm. In this, in this case, the writes coming back, they pass to the platform to Drupal or even directly to Drupal, or then you can queue them in the uh, external API system and then execute them one by one in Drupal so that the Drupal won't be dead under the, the weight of the uh, traffic. The writes might become problematic uh, because you have to write a lot of uh, extra code for handling the writes into Drupal. If there's a lot of writes, then you'd have to think of an architecture that works better. But this is usually the case that you get like 10% of writes and 90% of feeding out data. Um, you might have something stored already on the uh, Node.js layer or the acceleration layer. External API layer is built performance oriented with like Node.js. But um, this is only for content, although I was there, the whole talk is about content and delivering content, but um, sometimes you need some other services from Drupal because Drupal offers a lot of services outside of content as well. So there's on vacation, uh, there's, you know, user roles, user groups, user friends, connections. All those services would be needed to be cached on the API layer, and that's there's no module for that, at least yet. We've been pondering on creating one for that as well. What you gain from an uh, external API on, on in, you know, in front of Drupal is you have the full control of the API, so you, then you can, you know, use a version and use your you can aggregate the different sources uh, from ERPs. This is, this is a real world case. We have like six different background systems that we aggregate information to an acceleration layer serving our data. And you'll get placing performance if you do it right. Here's proof. This is an actual screenshot from, um, from a um, performance tool online. So that's a service serving our triple data, about 13,000 requests per second, and it can do different kind of filtering and stuff. There's a Node.js and a MongoDB backend behind that. Um, by the way, in, at this rate of requests, you'll also become an expert on um, optimizing Linux TCP connections uh, because they tend to become problematic at this rate. But then that's what you have to do. When when you're talking about systems like um, Internet of Things, serving them with a special API, you're going to be deep in you know big companies or at least companies with a lot of systems around. So I would, you know, think about it as a as a path to taking Drupal to enterprise. So when you try to get Drupal as a backend system in an enterprise to serve content around, you know, different platforms, different services, different uh, machines, um, there's going to be, you know, resistance from enterprise architects that have grown, you know, used to Microsoft-only world. They, they would like you to use 
instead of a REST API, they would like to, to use the Azure Service Bus or BizTalk or something like that. Or not definitely run a Linux server in their, in their systems. But that's, that's something that might happen there. All right, let's do a quick recap of the presentation. If you fell asleep, uh, just keep your eyes open for the next three slides, and I promise you, you you'd be on, on top of things again. So, Internet of Things is a buzzword. It means a lot of things, but usually just devices not originally directed at connecting, but, but are kind of getting connected these days for added value can use Drupal for content or variety of services like authentication and authorization. And as I said, it's, it's all about your courage to just do it. And how do you do it? The REST API is the most straightforward of ways. And Drupal 7 has a you know, bunch of good REST API modules, but uh, Drupal 8 has, a, has REST in core, as you all should know by now. We just need to get it out, but yeah. APIs should be either versioned or backwards compatible. And uh, sometimes a REST API just isn't enough because your Internet of Things device specifically requires some really odd connection method, and then you'll have to be coding and hacking away through some nights. And then when you have your stuff you know, delivered from Drupal, you can move your API outside of Drupal for performance, better control for aggregation of services, and you can just index it outside with, to a MongoDB and serve it out with Node.js. That's the thing. Thank you. So if you have any questions, please walk to the mic because it's apparently at least very important to record everything here. There's like big, big notes around. Questions? Go ahead. Either walk to the mic or then I have to repeat your question. That's. Um, I had a question about uh, the architecture. You said uh, you should mm -hmm. use at least some simple sort of queuing uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, do you use like um, enterprise service bus systems in your setups? Um, I try to avoid, you know, stuff like that. I consider like the Microsoft technologies I mentioned, like uh, Azure Service Bus, one of those systems that. Does but but they do that what they what they claim they're just hugely expensive and and you know kind of I think hard to get connected to your systems but yeah use enterprise service bus buses would be one option for that but I'm talking about maybe a bit more simplified queuing I've, you know I've seen well there's a story about doing a lunch, uh, uh, an electronic lunch, lunch voucher thing that sent, that it, it, that's happened five years ago or something. It sent you an SMS for, you know, for your lunch voucher so you, you could, you know, buy lunch. But it did, you know, subtract your balance every time, but it didn't, it only tried once to send the SMS. And that's, that's the problem with queuing. It just lost the information that it was trying to send you an SMS. If, and the SMS sending system was really unreliable at that point. So I'm just, expecting someone to try until it works, you know, some kind of a queue. It doesn't need to be enterprise queuing system. Yeah, yeah but like what about uh, like open source Java? Uh, I can't remember the name, but it, it really works perfect for the situation that you just described. Yeah, I would, I would totally prefer open source Java yeah. ser service buses, yeah, instead of the um, hardcore proprietary stuff. I haven't used um, I guess we've we've once used some kind of an Apache project that was a service bus, but pretty rarely, yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Thank you.